Hey guys, how's it going? Dave here from DaveMaraPhotography.com. Today I'm going to bring you part one of my three-part video series of planning for night and Milky Way photography. So the photo you're looking at here was taken on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State this past summer. As you can see over here on the right-hand side, the crescent moon setting over the Pacific Ocean, and the Milky Way is also rising here in the center. Now to get a shot like this, it takes some in-depth and specific planning to make sure you know everything will line up at the right time and you'll be there to capture it under the stars. So today, and in the following video series, I'm going to show you the steps I take each and every time to plan for a shoot like this. So when I go out to plan a shoot, the first thing I always want to do is look at moon phase. Now you can shoot at any time during the month under all different moon phases, but depending on the type of night photography you're going to take that specific night, you'll want a different kind of moon phase. Now, if you want to take Milky Way photography, you don't want the moon to be in the sky or you want the moon to be a slight crescent as seen in the picture before. If a full moon's in the sky, all of that ambient light from the moon isn't going to allow you to see the Milky Way very well. So for Milky Way photography, you're going to choose a moon phase that's right around the new moon. And the new moon is when you can't see the moon in the sky at all. So for December 2014, it would be the 21st and 22nd would be great nights to shoot the Milky Way. And the actual new moon comes at December 21st this month at 7.36 p.m. And at 7.36 p.m., the new moon means that the moon is directly between Earth and the sun, meaning none of the ambient light from the sun can be seen reflecting off the moon. If I wanted to take some Milky Way photos, I could probably get some really nice shots between the 16th of December and the 30th of December if the Milky Way was in the sky. And the Milky Way being in the sky really depends on where you are on Earth, and we'll work on that in one of the later video tutorials. Now it's also possible to get some really nice shots under different parts of the moon phase. I'll often go out and shoot when the moon's full or very close to full to get some really nice backlit images, and I can show you right here. This shot of Mount Rainier was taken at twilight, but you can see that the moonlight's starting to come in from the sides as well as the twilight from the sun. And that provides some really nice ambient light on the entire scene, which you wouldn't get if you weren't shooting under a heavy moon, such as the full moon. Here's another shot that was taken under the full moon. This was the supermoon in August of 2014. And the moon would be coming out right here, out of the right top side of the photo. And that's where all this light on the mountains is coming from, that full moonlight. This Milky Way shot right here was taken during the new moon, so you couldn't see any of the moonlight at all, leaving the Milky Way very bright in the sky. This is a shot at Mount Hood in Oregon, which was taken also under moonlight. I think this was about a three-quarter moon, and you can see it shining in right here on the edges and lighting up the mountain and all the water. And this is actually the moonlight just fading in here to the landscape. Here's one last shot that was also taken under a full moon. The moon was right up here out of the top left corner, and you can see the light shining down in here on this landscape, which would have been dark otherwise if we didn't have the moonlight shining in. So let's jump back over here to the moon phases. As we had discussed, you can shoot at any time during these moon phases and still get some great photography. If you want to take some good Milky Way photos, you'll just need to stay close to the new moon. So the next thing you'll want to do is find a dark place to shoot. And by dark place to shoot, I mean a place with no light pollution or ambient light from surrounding cities, cars, or anything else like that. Now, Blue Marble DE Nightlights 2012 will give you a great image of the world and what it looks like with ambient light pollution. So we can come in here and we can look at a place we want to shoot. And for this specific shoot, I'm going to choose the Olympic Peninsula of Washington, as I had showed you in that photo before. So if we look at the Olympic Peninsula, we can see there's not much light pollution at all. These little yellow areas are the light polluted areas, such as Seattle and Forks and Port Angeles, while the dark blue areas, such as out here in the Olympic Wilderness, doesn't have any light pollution at all. So for this shoot, we're going to say we're going to shoot right along the coastline of the Olympic Peninsula. If we want to see what it actually looks like, we can just turn on the satellite button over here, or we can click back to the night button right next to it. So we're going to shoot right in this area. And that looks pitch black, so that'll work great for Milky Way photography. So after we do that, the next thing we need to do is check for clear skies. So if we don't have clear skies, there's no way we're going to get a nice photo of the night sky, because the clouds are going to be blocking it. So to find out if we're going to have clear skies or not, I like to use the National Weather Service cloud cover charts. So just put in a big city up here, close to where you'll be at, and I'll link this below the video for you to go ahead and get. I like to just start with a big city because it's easy to find, and then I can go from there on the map. So I'll click Seattle, Washington, and then the forecast will pop up. Now you'll have this map over here on your right hand side, and you can just take this map, and we'll go back to that place that I had found before 
on my Blue Marble Navigator and I'll just click that same location since that's where we're actually going to shoot. So now it's relocated my forecast over here to the coast where I want to shoot. So you can read all these detailed forecasts and you can also read the forecast discussion and that'll give you a good idea what's going to happen in the short and long term. But what I really like to use are these hourly weather graphs. And you can just click on that. I turn off sleet, freezing rain, snow, thunder, and all that stuff. And I keep the rest of them on. And you can also select the date you're going to be shooting. So you can move this around within a few days and you can kind of get the forecast for that time and date. So the real thing we want to look at here is we want to look at these relative humidity, precipitation potential, and sky cover percentage. So you can see for this time of year, Simber in the Pacific Northwest, it's pretty cloudy. So you can see that the sky cover percentages are way up. It's 86%, 95%, 100%. That means the sky is completely covered with clouds and you wouldn't be able to see the stars in the night sky. So most of the time, I'll aim for sky cover percentages that are between 0 and 20%. Uh, you can still get some good shots when it's up in the 50% range, 60% range. Another thing you also want to watch for is the surface wind. So if you have a 50-60% cloud cover, but you have a strong wind, that means that those clouds are going to be moving through pretty quickly, and you'll probably still get some breaks in those clouds, which you can shoot the Milky Way in night sky. But if you have a surface wind that's 0 miles per hour, and you have 60-70% cloud cover, then those clouds are just going to sit in one place and it's going to be hard to get some shots. So it's good to watch the surface wind as well as the cloud cover percentages. I don't really mind precipitation potential. If there's not going to be much cloud cover but it's going to rain a little bit, it's not a big deal. I don't really mind standing out in the rain if there's going to be some breaks in the clouds. So the last thing we want to look at is relative humidity. Relative humidity is not a huge deal. If it's clear out and it's high humidity, you can still go out and get some really nice shots. So if there's a really high relative humidity, it means there's a lot of water particles in the air, and these water particles will kind of block your vision or your clear vision of the night sky, so your stars just won't be as sharp as they would if the relative humidity was low. So it's always good to watch for, but don't let the relative humidity kind of impede you from going out to shoot. So hopefully you've gained some good information in part one of my three-part series. In part two of my three-part series, I'm going to show you how I use the photographer's ephemeris to plan sunset, sunrise, moonset, and moonrise times, along with twilights, to get the best shots at the best times. And we're going to go with an in-depth tutorial showing you exactly the tips and tricks I use to do that. We'll also be jumping into Google Earth while I'll show you how I use Google Earth to get exact locations and planning data before I go out to plan my shoots. In part three of this series, we'll use another free program called Stellarium, which can actually help you in-depth plan for your Milky Way and night sky shoots. Within Stellarium, you can actually see exactly where the Milky Way will rise and set on a given night and how bright it will be in the sky. This is an awesome program if you want to play it for your night sky shoots. So subscribe to my channel, tune in, and I'll show you on the next tutorials how to do these things and plan for your own night sky shoots. Have a good one. Thanks for watching.